All right, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, great to have you here this evening for a night in the Bell Museum's collections. We're coming to you live and direct from Minnesota Makoche, the land of the Dakota. My name is George Weiblin. I'm the museum science director and a professor of plant microbial biology. And as you may be aware, this year 2022 is a really special year for the Bell. 150 years ago in 1872, our state legislature founded a geological and natural history survey, including a museum to be established at the University of Minnesota with a charge to collect, preserve, study, display, and interpret the natural history of our great state. And today we have over 1.2 million specimens in our scientific collections, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fishes, plants, fungi, from Minnesota and from locations all over the world where Minnesotans have studied. From algae to zebra mussels, we probably have some, and only a fraction are on display publicly in our new facility. Most are stored in facilities on the St. Paul campus of the university and cared for by the faculty curators who are joining you tonight. Uh, specimens are used by faculty students, researchers all over the world uh, to study evolutionary history, document global change, and investigate countless other aspects of the diversity of life on our planet. Tonight, our host, Emily Glassley, a noted science communicator, video host, uh, and the curators of the museum are gonna take you behind the exhibits into our scientific collections. Uh, introducing you to but a few of the truly unique and remarkable specimens that we have of Earth's biodiversity record. Now, as we reflect on the museum's past and think about its future, we take a moment to recognize the colonial history of exploration and exploitation that disrespected and dispossessed indigenous peoples of their knowledge, their lifeways and natural resources. And this historical legacy reverberates among us today, especially here in Minnesota and in our museum. At the time of the Bell Museum's founding, indigenous knowledge and ownership were largely disregarded as those in power sought to command a new territory that they claimed as their own property. And so I'd like to specifically acknowledge the Dakota indigenous keepers of the land on which the Bell Museum sits and where I join you tonight. Uh, this land was reserved in U.S. treaties with the Dakota in 1805, 1837, and 1851, and particularly because my own ancestors excluded Dakota people from some of this sacred land, I recognize our responsibility to consider its future together with our Dakota relatives. And as we are a statewide institution, I also acknowledge on behalf of the Bell, the Ojibwe people, the traditional Anishinaabe keepers of the 1854 treaty lands to our no north. Uh, the knowledge systems of Dakota and Ojibwe are essential ways of knowing the place that we now call Minnesota. And we know that supporting people and communities who sustain indigenous knowledge isn't enough. And so as we mark our 150th anniversary, we commit to better understanding our own institutional and personal histories in, in light of indigenous dispossession and erasure. And in so doing, uh, we're pledging that we redress the past, live in the present and seek a good future in a shared responsibility that's grounded in listening to and respecting all our relations. And so centered on the land where the museum sits, where we conduct our work as learners and teachers, it's my great pleasure to introduce our host this evening, Emily Grassley. Emily Grassley is a science communicator and writer, video host, and educational media producer. 2013 to 2020, she was the first ever chief curiosity correspondent for the Field Museum in Chicago, creating more than 200 episodes for The Brain Scoop, a natural history oriented YouTube channel where videos have been viewed many tens of millions of times. And she made her broadcast TV debut in 2020 on public broadcast service, um, Prehistoric Road Trip, a three-part series exploring paleontology and natural history across Dakota's Montana and Wyoming. 
and also a PBS Digital Studios program in our nature in 2021. Today, she's independently producing Art Lab, a show that celebrates the intersection of art and science in partnership with the Describe and Caption Media program. Uh, this uh, is true to our heart here at The Bell, where we aspire to do some of those things as well. Uh, Emily has received many accolades for her work, including the Nancy Hanks Award from the American Alliance of Museums for Professional Excellence. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to everybody tuning in tonight. I am so excited for this event. Um, when the bell reached out to me to ask if I would like to be a part of this, I literally screamed in my house. Um, nothing brings me greater joy or excitement than to talk to scientists who are working here at the heart of um, interdisciplinary nature research um, and, and to be for this to be a part of a, a museum with such an amazing legacy 150 years of scientific research it's going to be a great night um, so before I get um, hopping into the conversation with some of the Bell scientists um, I want to mention a few technical things first um, we're going to be talking for uh, for about an hour or so, um, but we're going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So hold on to your questions. Um, you can always drop them into the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, you may have also noticed that we're live captioning the event. Um, if you find that distracting, you can hide it by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. But we'll also post a link if you want to see the captions in a separate browser. Um, and so now without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Tim Whitfield, who is the collections manager of the Herbarium. Welcome, Tim. Hi, nice to see, nice to see you and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm just so excited to be talking to you. Um, I think for a little bit of history, a little bit of context, um, can you talk about, we know that, you know, we're celebrating 150 years of Bell um, history. How much of that extends to the herbarium? How much of the collections is the herbarium? What is the herbarium? Um, let's just start with some of those questions. Well, that's a great question. And um, the Bell Museum Herbarium includes close to, or just over 950,000 specimens of plants, flowering plants, grasses, ferns, we also have fungi, we have uh, lichens, we have algae, and we have mosses. And these specimens are from all over uh, Minnesota, from all across North America, and from many different countries around the world, from Papua New Guinea to uh, places in Europe, Peru, South America, all over the world. And these specimens are dried and pressed and mounted onto archival sheets of paper, just like the one you can see on the right-hand side here. Of the, of the screen. And this particular specimen, um, I mentioned that the specimens come from all over, the, all over the world, so they represent an amazing geographic spread. But the other thing that's amazing about these collections um, is that they, they date back, uh, in some cases, nearly 200 years. And this particular specimen is from, from Minnesota, but collected in 1832. So this is one of our oldest specimens. Um, and so we have this amazing geographic spread of specimens, but also uh, specimens uh, that are collected from a large time gradient as well. And this particular, um, this particular slide, this image here, represents that range of, of dates that we have. So we have this 1832 prairie alum root specimen. And then on the left-hand side, we have a specimen, a stack of specimens that I collected just last summer. time. And uh, the next slide that is coming up, I think, um, will show one of the really exciting projects that, that we're working on currently in the herbarium, and that is to digitize all of the collections. And that means we're going to be taking a photograph of each specimen, 
and I say we, but really it's a team of undergraduate students who are doing this, dedicated students that work with us in the collections. They take photographs of each specimen and then they also transcribe the data from the labels that are on each specimen. And those, those labels will uh, tell where the specimen was collected and when it was collected and who collected it. And so these give us uh, uh, these give us this history of botanical diversity in the state and also around the world. And this online uh, database, the Minnesota Biodiversity Atlas, is available for anyone to search. And so any one of you can take a look at this and take a look at the specimens that we have. Uh, you can check out specimens that were collected from your local area, from your town. Um, you could look at distribution of specimens of particular species. So for example, if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, a range map, for example, this is the prairie alum route that's the same as that 1832 specimen. This shows all those dots on the map that show locations of where we have a specimen of this particular species. And so it gives a really definitive documentation of this particular plant and where it grows across the state. And so this tool, this, the Biodiversity Atlas is a really useful way to look at where species grow, but you can also use it in other ways. And, and the next slide will show that. So for example, we can look at change through time of plant diversity. Um, and in this case, we're looking at a, a particular invasive species that many of you may be familiar with, the common buckthorn. And if you look at the panel in the upper left-hand corner, uh, you can see the first specimen we have of buckthorn from 1937, right uh, smack in the Twin Cities and Minneapolis. Um, and then moving to the right there, this particular species, the buckthorn, is spreading across the state. By the 1970s, we've documented it in several different places. And then if you go down to the lower right-hand corner, buckthorn is now becoming pretty abundant, especially around the Twin Cities, but all across southern Minnesota. And then you come up to the present day, and you can see that buckthorn is documented in all these locations across the state particularly abundant in the southern and western parts of the state, but even now becoming more common uh, up in Duluth and the northeastern part of the state. And so these collections... I just wanna, oh, sorry. sorry, can I just jump in there really quick? Because I think yeah. it, this is already talking about um, an amazing, you know, data set of more than a century of being able to document things like buckthorn, which is an invasive species, um, and how it's been able to sort of take over. Um, but in the spirit of thinking about the Bell collections as a whole, I mean, this isn't unique just to the herbarium. This mm -hmm. is the sort of, um, this is the sort of thing that can be learned by looking at any of those kind of collections. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not just the herbarium. The, the, the Biodiversity Atlas includes uh, the specimens from all across the collections. Uh, the, the botanical collections and the zoological collections as well. So it could be used in that in the same way for, for any one of our collection sets. And it makes it really exciting, I think, to, to think about uh, these collectors from 150 or 200 years ago that were collecting all these plants. They had no idea that in 2021, we would be able to display them online and use them in this exciting way. And then also really exciting to me is that the specimens that I collect today, I have no idea what will be happening in 150 years from now and how my specimens might be used. So it makes for a really dynamic and interesting um, uh, kind of uh, uh, aspect of the collections. And I mean, these collections are dead, but the collection, the, the specimens are dead, I should say, but the collection itself is very much alive. I love that. I mean, it, it's there's such vibrancy to museum collections, and I think we are gradually and thankfully moving away from this um, idea that museums are old, dead, stuffy, dusty. You know, we're, they're really dynamic places of some great scientific discovery. So, Tim, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, we're going to be moving on to our next um, scientist, uh, introducing. Uh, Dr. Keith Barker, he is the Curator of Genetic Resources and the Associate Professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior. Um, and Keith is going to be talking to us about some of his work um, studying genetics and also um, birds. Lovely. Hi, Keith. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. I was muted, but um, yes, thank you for that introduction. Um, 
I'm not going to talk too much about my own research. I'm going to actually spend a little more time talking about the collections. Um, I am an ornithologist, so I'm going to focus on birds and specifically. Um, I, my research is focusing on primarily phylogenetics using large-scale genetic data sets to, in, to infer the evolutionary history of birds. Um, but to, tonight I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Bell Museum, especially the, the curators and the curation of the bird collections. Um, so if I go to the next slide, I should have the oldest or actually, so before I go to that, George mentioned that the Bell Museum is the official natural history museum of Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. And that's actually um, set in law, in state law here. You can see this is an excerpt from the, the, the um, law that sets up the University of Minnesota as the steward of the collections from the statewide um, survey of biological, geological, uh, diversity and yeah so that was founded in 1872 and the collections knocked around various places in the University of Minnesota pretty much until um, the founding curator of the Bell Museum who was also the first director of the Bell Museum Thomas Sadler Roberts um, established the museum uh, not in 1940 um, so if we look next, uh, the next slide here, this is actually our oldest bird specimen that we have at the Bell Museum. This is a warbling vireo, and it was collected by T Thomas Sadler Roberts, T.S. Roberts, uh, in 1873. You can see the tag on the specimen in the lower left there. Um, this is interesting history. Um, T.S. Roberts had a very long uh, life here in Minnesota. He was originally born in uh, Pennsylvania in a farm outside of Philadelphia. But his father moved his family to Minneapolis because he had tuberculosis and the air here was considered healthy um, and he was encouraged to wander around outside a lot. And so he moved the family to Minnesota, to Minnesota and he and his son would wander around um, with the horse and horse and carriage and uh, Roberts learned to love the outdoors and learn all about uh, nature and he's at the age of 14 uh, we think he learned how to prepare bird specimens uh, from a friend who was visiting the Twin Cities and so this specimen from 1873 uh, Roberts was born in 1858 so he would have been uh, 15 when he uh, prepared this specimen uh, and then if you look at the next one, this is from a few years later, so I think he was 18 when he prepared this specimen of a blue jay. And these are some of the uh, Robert's collections as a teenager, actually, there's something like 600 specimens that he prepared over those few years before he went to college are the foundation of the bird collection um, at, the, at the, the Bell Museum. And so he actually went on to become, he, so he, for, he was two years uh, at the University of Minnesota as an undergraduate. Uh, he took a break because he actually um, became a little ill, did some surveying work, moved back to the East Coast to, to study medicine at the, at the University of Pennsylvania, got his MD, came back to the Twin Cities, and worked as a doctor for a long time. But while all the whole time he was working as a doctor, he was studying Minnesota birds. And eventually, um, in 1915, he retired from his medical practice and uh, started teaching at the ornithology at the University of Minnesota and became the director of um, the university collections uh, that were mandated by the state of Minnesota. And eventually, he, uh, through all of his connections in the Twin Cities, he became acquainted with James Ford Bell, sound familiar, um, who was the founder of General Mills, the first president of General Mills, and through his patronage eventually by, the, by 1940 uh, built the first structure that was a dedicated building for the Bell Museum of Natural History, uh, which was obviously named after him because of his patronage. So. Um, 
that's kind of the, the, the early history of the museum. And, and the cool thing about uh, Roberts, or I mean, there are lots of cool things about Roberts, but one of the cool things is that he founded the museum with a, an outlook towards um, public outreach. One of the big goals of the new museum was to build a, a museum that had exhibits that could interest people in the outdoors and in nature and in birds in particular, which was his passion. So the dioramas that are a central part of the new Bell Museum and were a central part of the original Bell Museum were part of that mission. And here, this slide here is showing uh, the birds of Minnesota, which was sort of his magnum opus, a summary of um, the, the, the birds that uh, occurred here in Minnesota, including lots of beautiful um, artistic plates. Uh, here we have a passenger pigeon, which used to be a yard bird in Minneapolis. Um, we actually have specimens that Roberts collected in Minneapolis of this species, which sadly is now extinct. Um, but he, he actually got together a bunch of um, generous donors to subsidize publication of this book so that he could sell it at, I think, half publication cost so that people who wanted to learn about birds could afford to learn about birds. Um, so his, his dedication to, to reaching people with uh, passion about nature was, 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 I think, admirable. And it's something that we try to perpetuate in the Bell Museum now. I love that story. Um, I also, I had no idea that he figured out a way to subsidize it, like ed educational resources. It's sort of like we are still overcoming barriers to education today, but constantly coming up with new ways um, of making these collections and science and nature more accessible in general. So mm -hmm. I want to go back a little bit and talk about the specimens themselves, just in, for people who may not be familiar with natural history museums. When you talk about um, a bird collection, I think it, a lot of people might imagine these things all posed and lifelike and taxidermied. But from the images that you showed about the Bell's Vireo, small bird, you know, three mm -hmm. inches, the blue jay, um, six inch bird, they're all sort of like flat laid out. Um, why are they prepared that way? Are they still prepared that way? And is, is there a purpose behind that? Yes, they're very much prepared that way still. Those are called study skins. Um, and it's a very specific way of preparing birds in a way that preserves their plumage in particular, but also their mouth parts their, their, and, their, and their feet for study using um, quantitative measurements uh, so length and width and that sort of thing, but also measurements of color of the feathers and that sort of thing. But it's very, it, it, the preparation is very focused on making sure that the specimen is resistant to attack by insects. For instance, if there's any flesh left there, um, that can be the, attacked by insects. So we remove all of that. If there's any fat left, that can seep through the feathers and stain them. So we remove that and we stuff them with cotton. Um, and they um, are compact, so they're, they're stretched out and fairly flat so that we can have lots and lots of drawers of them stacked one over the other um, to compactly store those collections, similar to the way, you know, library, library books are, are stacked on shelves. And I mean, that's fundamentally what that is. That's the, our library record of biodiversity on this planet. Uh, it's stacks of herbarium sheets, it's, it's drawers full of these specimens that record, you know, annual variation, seasonal variation, variation among species, among populations that let us understand the diversity of the world. I mean, we, we think there are somewhere between, between 10 and 20,000 bird species on the planet. That's because we have specimens of those 10 to 20,000 bird species and we can compare them to one another in quantitative ways. And over time, I mean, I think the, with new technology, it allows us to use these specimens in ways that we could never have imagined. Certainly that Roberts wasn't thinking, um, oh, yes. you know, early 1910s, he wasn't like genetic research. That seems like something that will happen in the next no. century. I mean, um, they didn't know what DNA was. I mean, so, or, or what its function was for sure. Um, and so now we can take a specimen out of the drawer and extract DNA and we could sequence the entire genome of that animal if we wanted to. Um, and n nobody had any idea. Similarly to 
you know, eggs that were collected um, from raptors prior to DDT and after DDT, which gave us insight into the fact that the, the advent of DDT was causing eggshell thinning and led to the, the massive decline of species like bald eagles and peregrine falcons. Right, so just even being able to see over time how pesticides are having this like greater ecological impact. Right. Um, I love those stories so much. Keith, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's a perfect segue into our next scientist, um, also an ornithologist, so we're keeping it on the bird kick. Um, so Dr. Sushma Reddy is the Breckenridge Chair of Ornithology, uh, Curator of Birds, and Associate Professor of the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. And um, I think Sushma's work is phenomenal because it picks up where we were just talking with Keith about using things like genetic information and new technology um, to uh, just learn new things about species today. And Sushma is holding a penguin and I am so excited to have her join me because we're gonna talk about some of my favorite birds. I can't wait. Sushma, yeah. are you here? Uh, thanks Emily for the introduction. Yeah, so, you know, I, um, I wanted to start with a little bit of maybe personal history. I, you know, we all come into our um, careers in different ways. And I got here um, by a love of museums. You know, the first time I went behind the scenes at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, I just instantly felt comfortable and at home and loved it and loved that every specimen tells a story. And each of these stories gets even more exciting when you add other specimens to them. Um, when I got to the Bell Museum, I had already started this project, this collaboration to work on penguins. And I had no idea until I started opening up the cabinets that we actually had quite a lot of penguins collected by a former curator here, uh, David Parmalee, who had gone to some of the same places that I was interested in going in. And it was really exciting to to open up these cabinets and find these great specimens and then be able to go there recently on a trip to some of the same sites that he had gone to over the years. Um, before we go to the next slide, I wanted to point out that what's really great in this picture is in our collections, we have penguins and then below them are the loons, which is the Minnesota state bird. And for a long time, people um, I you know, thought these were related birds because they look similar. They are both in cold environments, but in opposite sides of the world. And uh, you know, you can uh, now with DNA evidence um, and other things, we know um, that they're not that closely related. So um, this is a specimen of a Gentoo penguin, and this is a penguin that. Um, we used to think was one species, and we recently, using DNA and um, morphological measurements, which means we measured the bill and the wings and the feet and different uh, body parts, and we looked at um, where they live in different parts of the world, we actually were able to show that what we thought was one species of Gentoo penguin is actually four different species of Gentoo penguins. The ones that live in Antarctica are different from the ones that live in the Falkland Islands, and the ones that live in South Georgia are different, as well as the ones that live in this area called Kerguelen. So these are all places that you might not have heard of too, um, too much, but they're um, right, around the, um, right around Antarctica, and they have populations of penguins that have uh, been um, that hang out and breed in those areas and don't move too much and have um, haven't met each other for millions of years and so this is pretty good ev evidence for us that these are actually distinct species, even though um, very superficially they look alike. And um, I wanted to show you that you know using specimens from museum collections here's a nice. Um, view of the, the wings, and um, we use these measurements. Penguins don't actually have a lot of um, muscle on the wings. It's very much at the arm, and the rest of it is um, just used for, for helping them um, kind of navigate through the waters, but for the most part, they don't use their wings as much as other birds do, but it's really interesting to see how they do use them when um, I saw them live. If you can keep going, I can show you some of the pictures from my recent trip. 
Um, here, yes, here we go. So here are some pictures from uh, a beach in South Georgia. And um, here's a, a picture, one of the, the new species of penguin we described, hanging out with um, a king penguin. And here you can see that um, you know, they, they occupy a variety of habitats. It was really interesting to see, um, see them in, their, in uh, where they're nesting, how they're taking care of their young, um, where how they uh, pretty much you know, make nests out of little uh, pebbles and rocky areas and poop everywhere and don't seem to be bothered by it. <laughs> Um, we collected a lot of those things. We collected poop. We collected um, eggshells that were abandoned because we're finding that there's a lot of um, interesting aspects of this, uh, the shape of eggshells. And, and um, perhaps there's something about the composition and the thickness of eggshells that we can use later on, just like the story that um, Keith was telling about peregrine falcon eggs um, and bald eagle eggs helping us to figure out the effects of DDT. We also were able to get samples of blood to, again, look at population dynamics and feathers to look at um, what uh, feathers can tell us what penguins were eating at different times. And so we can actually use that to compare specimens we collected today. I mean, sorry, um, this year for, to specimens we collected um, many years ago and actually see if there are uh, dietary changes and shifts that are happening in relation to what human um, human impacts are, are causing these areas in these areas. And then um, I was really fortunate that this trip that we went on, we got to see lots of different types of penguins. And uh, here are just a few of the species that we got to see, uh, chin straps, the dailies, macaroni, and uh, gentoos, just uh, some of my favorite ones. And um, the last one I wanted to show you was um, the, a picture of me actually getting some specimens. Uh, we got permits to be able to get salvage specimens. So salvage means that we can um, collect things that are already dead. And um, you can see here that I am busy at work, even though they're beautiful penguins and I'm in this amazing setting. And I, uh, there were all these, um, Penguins that were um, unfortunately had died from some cause and had been um, very nicely cleaned through by scavengers. And um, these specimens um, are still complete in terms of uh, the anatomical information, all the, the bones that were there. So I was able to bring this back. Here's something that, you know, would have just been lying around and not being used by anything else. And we can bring this into a museum collection, clean it up a little bit more and uh, contribute it to our collection of comparative specimens. So scientists years from now can go through and be able to compare this and use this to look at lots of different aspects, things that we might not even begin to know about today, but um, perhaps um, find um, lots of novel uses for in a few years. Thank you, Sushma. I am obsessed pictures of adorable, beautiful penguins. I'm just like, how are you able to concentrate on doing anything besides just pointing and being like, that is cute. That's cute. I mean, it, it, <laughs> I just I did so take excited. a couple of thousand pictures. So <laughs> there you go. So one thing that kind of stuck out to me, you mentioned collecting a lot of things. You're you're very resourceful in the field. Uh, you know, salvaging things, uh, but you also mentioned like eggshells and poop. Like I have not, it's, are these normal things to be collecting now? And, and you mentioned blood, like, I, yeah. how are, how are, what are you doing with all these different kinds of samples? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and you know, the, the question, the, the way you phrased it is exactly right. These are normal things we're doing now, right. Um, as we're, Thinking more about the uses of specimens, and um, you know, we're we're doing all these things that they didn't know we could do 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and we're thinking forward and thinking about what what can people do with some of this, um, some of these specimens, some of these data points, and so we're just trying to maximize that. And you know, if you if you're going to spend a lot of time and effort getting to a remote part of the world, you want to be able to take as many things out of that as possible. And so we, um, you know, people um, think that, oh, well, 
dead animals and eggshells and poop are just things that are just lying around and are kind of the castaways of, of what's happening in a, in a habitat, but those things can be really valuable. Poop can tell us about diet, about disease. It can tell us um, about the ecosystem as well, right? Not just about the actual, the, the animal that pooped it. <laughs> um, <Sure. laughs> for lack of better uh, ways of saying that, right? Um, and so we're, we're thinking forward and we're thinking in terms of like as many ways as doing this. Of course, there's a bit of a trade-off of like, we can't keep everything, we can't store everything, but we're trying to be able to, we're trying to do the best we can to maximize information. Well, and over time you need smaller and smaller samples of things, right? Like you can pull DNA, genetic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, genetic information out of the root of a tooth of something from a hundred years ago. And so, you know, it's, it's just amazing to even think about, you might not, I mean, we'll continue to add to collections, but the way that these natural history collections evolve over time is very different than what they were doing 150 years ago. So for sure, for sure. Thank you so much, Sushma. I wish we could look at pictures of adorable penguins all night, but we will be <laughs> moving on to pictures of other adorable things like pickled fish. I promise that they are cute. Um, I'm also biased. I just love fish collections. So <laughs> without further ado, um, I'm introducing our next scientist, Dr. Andrew Simons, who's the curator of fishes and the professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Biology. Um, and Dr. Simons is gonna be talking to us about not only um, fishes, but also mollusks, mollusks, excuse me, and bivalves, some of my favorite animals, hands down, no joke. So hello, Andrew, are you there? Hello, Emily, thanks so much for the introduction. And yes, uh, I study fishes, but I'm also lucky enough to be the curator of the mollusk and crustacean collection at the Bell Museum. Uh, and in this photo, you can see uh, how these animals are, are stored. Most of them are stored as dry shells. And uh, this collection is a very important collection in Minnesota. It has about 25,000 specimens. And the collection is heavily used not only by uh, academic scientists, but also uh, local state agency scientists. So the Minnesota DNR are visiting us all the time. Uh, and they visit and are interested in these animals because many of them are endangered. Uh, changes in river systems have reduced their numbers. Uh, there was a flourishing button industry where buttons were drilled out of mussel shells uh, about 100 years ago. And that sort of decimated the numbers of these animals. And, and so the, the state is very interested in uh, figuring out where they used to live. Uh, and then reintroducing them into places where they where they used to be, and so it's a very, it's a very interesting collection. And as an ichthyologist, someone who studies fish, mussels are really interesting because they are parasitic on fishes early in their life history, and so mussels rely on fish to uh, move upstream and colonize new habitats. So we could jump to the next slide, I think. So. Uh, this is a, a pistol grip, and this is one of our older specimens. You can see this thing was collected in 1895 from the Minnesota River near uh, Fort Snelling. And these animals, as we've mentioned many times, that these, these, these uh, collections, these specimens serve as kind of time capsules. So even though this was collected in 1895, it was 10 to 15 years old, or even older when it was collected. And the shell is laid down in layers. And so if one were to sample each layer of the shell, you could get a window into the water chemistry of the time when this animal was alive. They also have all kinds of crazy shapes and shell textures. And we don't really understand the purpose of the shell textures. And one of my graduate students is studying this. And we've seen sort of similar textures evolve multiple times. And we think that they are involved in uh, helping the mussel maintain its position in the substrate. And then they also, the part of the mussel where the shell is exposed, they change the flow of water around the mussel so the mussel doesn't, so the, the substrate isn't scoured away, so the mussel isn't lifted out of the substrate and lifted, taken downstream in floods. So uh, yeah, they're uh, very cool animals. And yes, I see someone in the chat has corrected me. And yeah, I think it is, the date is 1885. So thank you for that. And so uh, these specimens, this specimen, uh, this species, the pistol grip, are widespread in Eastern North America. Uh, 
they're no longer in the Minnesota River, sadly enough, but they are still present in other parts of the state. And so we could maybe, do you want to chat about mussels a little bit before we yeah, shift? Yeah, let's, let's give some, let's give a moment um, to talk about our invertebrate friends, because I just have a personal fondness for bivalves that is difficult for me to explain to some people. But I mean, these are truly, truly underrated animals. Would you not agree? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, I think one of the coolest things about them is that the female mussels need to get their parasitic larvae into fish and they've evolved all kinds of crazy strategies. And so when it's time to release their larvae, the females emerge out of the substrate and uh, in some species, they flap their mantle and the mantle is, is patterned like a fish. And so a predatory fish will come in and try and bite it. And then the female will spray all these larvae into that other fish's gills. Uh, another, some of them mimic crayfish. Uh, then some of them spit out little worm-like packets of larvae. And these float downstream and stick. They run into sticky and they stick in the stream to a rock and flutter. And then what fish you know, can pass that up. So, and then there's a really cool one in, in the south that extrudes this long transparent mucus strand. And then at the end of that strand, there's like a lure that's filled with these parasitic larvae. And so these, these mussels are like fishing for, for hosts. Oh my gosh. I like, my eyes are welling up with tears. You told me things about bivalves I didn't know today. And I'm so excited. Like, yeah, I had no idea. And I, I like to call them livers of our rivers because they're the filter feeders, right? That help keep rivers clean and a lot of other organisms rely on them. And so that's another reason I think that we should be anchoring more of our love. Yeah, that was a joke about absolutely. bivalves. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think that I think that is estimates that the water from the Mississippi River would have passed, historically would have passed through mussels like six or eight times the entire water column or uh, would have passed through these mussels and been filtered on its way to the Gulf Coast. Amazing. So yeah, they're incredibly important animals and, and are overlooked and understudied. But they are, you know, they are a, a key species in freshwater environments. And that is a great segue into our next conversation with you, because you don't actually study bivalves, you study fish. Um, they live in the same place, they're neighbors, right? That's true, that's true. I do study fish, and so this is a photograph of me in the, in the Bell Museum fish collection. And uh, this is a really cool collection, I'm biased, but it has about uh, 50,000 jars of fish. And I think we have about 300 specimens. And uh, I've been curating this collection over the last 20 years and have managed to shape the collection as, as, uh, as it's grown. Uh, with the changes in my students' interests. And so we have fishes from Minnesota. We've got fishes from the Southeast United States. Uh, we've been collecting in Japan and Thailand and Taiwan. And so it's been really fantastic. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, they, they may look drab, but uh, this is one of my favorite species of fish. It's a streamlined chub. And, uh, these things are native to the Ohio, Tennessee, and Cumberland River drainages in sort of eastern and southern United States. And I picked this fish out to show to everyone today because in some ways it, this, this species and this spe these specimens sort of capture in some ways my career interests. Uh, um, these fish have a really interesting distribution and so they're great for studying, uh, for studies of phylogeography, which is linking uh, the phylogenetics or historical relationships of the fish which the, with the geography of, of the areas they inhabit. Um, they're highland fishes, so they live in really cool, clean uh, upland habitats. And uh, I remember the day where I collected these fishes. And so we were in this beautiful river in the Clinch River in, uh, in Tennessee. And uh, I was with uh, three of my students, two graduate students and an undergraduate student. and. Uh, one of those students is now a professor. Another student works for a state agency. Another one is a uh, is an influencer <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> but uh, but it it speaks to me too the importance. You know, as a curator, I don't just take care of these specimens, but I'm also a university professor. I teach, and I mentor, and so I've mentored these students. And then I also remember just the fun, the camaraderie of being out in the field with other scientists. Uh, 
collecting specimens and working on research. So that's that's why I chose these. And that's so lovely. I mean, it, it's it, it's amazing to be that it's something is um, seemingly I don't know. As you mentioned, drab as as some pickled fish can. There's so much more than pickled fish, right? They're they're data points, but they're also it's what you say about this idea of mentorship that science is passed down from generation to generation. We tend to talk about, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and this huge building body of knowledge and work. Um, and so thank you for sharing that. Thank you for, um, for sharing both of those stories. Um, we're going to be moving on um, to a collection that's not that far, um, probably, at least uh, in, a, in an environmental sense. Um, we're going to be talking with Dr. Ken Kozak, who's the curator of amphibians and reptiles and associate professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, Conservation, Biology. Ken, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks for the introduction. Hi. Hi. Of course. Hi. Um, well, just start out like with a little bit of context, like for this picture here. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a different story today, more, more of a local one in Minnesota, but um, so I'm the curator of amphibians and reptiles, and uh, I primarily work on salamanders. Um, so we've done a lot of work in the, the Southern Appalachian Mountains, added a lot of specimens um, to the collection. Um, I've also done some work in Mexico. Um, and this is a picture of me um, actually collecting arboreal salamanders in Mexico, which I'm not gonna talk to you about today, but they're, they're really interesting animals. And um, so the amphibian and re reptile collection, it's not as large as the fish collection. Fish collection has about 300,000 specimens. We have roughly somewhere in the low 20, 20,000 specimens. And historically, the collection has been primarily a collection of the upper Midwest, um, but it also has really interesting specimens from Mexico that my students and I have collected. Um, a previous curator has collected some really interesting specimens from Mexico. Um, we have specimens from Southeast Asia. And um, so the collection has become more diverse um, you know, over time. And I guess if we could go to the next slide here, I wanna talk a little bit um, about, I think an interesting local story. Um, so these are uh, specimens, these are cleared and stained specimens of leopard frogs. So leopard frogs are, they're really common frogs um, across the, across most of the United States actually. Um, and so what a cleared and stained specimen is, is what you're looking at here is we can, we can prepare, um, I didn't actually prepare these specimens, but you can, uh, you can make a specimen, you can basically um, remove, digest the skin in a sense and make the specimen clear and then provide different dyes, treat them with different dyes that make the bones here. You, you could, the bones are pink and you have cartilage that's blue there. And these are really interesting in the sense that um, instead of preparing a skeletal specimen that's incredibly laborious, um, you can get a really good look at the, the osteology or the skeletal anatomy of the specimen. Um, and so these were specimens that were collected by the Minnesota Pollution, Pollution Control Agency. And so back in about like uh, 1995, um, maybe some people that are tuned in here from Minnesota remember um, stories there of these deformed frogs that were popping up in central Minnesota, actually. Um, and they were collected by actually school children. And so they were getting buckets and buckets of these deformed frogs, um, which were, were pretty alarming. And so here you can see the, the frog on the left there. Um, you can see these deformities really well. Um, that frog has um, no arm on the right-hand side and it has basically two appendages on the left. Um, the one on the right, um, has an appendage coming out of the rib um, and instead of out of the, uh, the uh, pectoral girdle over there. Um, and so these uh, frogs were collected by the MPCA. Um, and basically they collected them across Minnesota. These frogs started showing up in other places. And one of the big questions was like, what was going on with these frog specimens? Actually, was this something that was always going on in Minnesota? And if it was going on, sort of at what rate was it, was it going on? And so this was a study that was initiated and run um, basic, uh, by Judith Helgen, who's now retired, um, but she worked at the MPCA for a very long period of time. And these were specimens that, there are about a thousand or so of these specimens that are deposited in the amphibian and reptile collection, these cleared and stained uh, specimens. Um, and so the story is really kind of interesting. 
Um, it ended up being like, they thought it was basically purely a chemical phenomenon, in, in particular atrazine. Atrazine is uh, a pesticide that they used to treat with corn. So these frogs were, you know, in places and kind of semi-rural areas where basically wooded areas abutted up against cornfields. And so these frogs, they migrate between terrestrial and they use aquatic habitats for reproduction. Um, and so what was thought was that it was pesticides that were actually leaching in um, to, to, the, to the environment. Um, and it turns out that the story is a little bit more complicated. Um, what appears to be going on is that it, um, it's not purely the pesticides all by himself in particular. Um, it's an interaction between the pesticides weakening the immune system of the frogs, making them basically more uh, susceptible to being uh, colonized or invaded by parasites during critical stages of de development that cause these different kinds of deformities. Um, so this collection of cleared stage frogs is really important in the sense that you can look at them. Um, these are just a couple of the different kinds of abnormalities. They're ones that are missing legs and have two different feet and all kinds of things. So categorizing um, the frequencies of different um, kinds of developmental abnormalities. Uh, abnormalities. And so if you switch to the next slide, um, so this is a jar of frogs and here's where the, the Bell Museum, so we, we have these specimens from the, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, um, but this is a really interesting use of collections, sort of reiterating the fact that, you know, we put these things on shelves and they, you know, from the outside, it can be seen as they sit around for a really, really long period of time and maybe they don't get much use. Leopard frogs are, you know, they're really common, you know, they're a dime a dozen, so to speak, but these were frogs that were um, collected in the 60s. This is a really large collection of frogs um, collected by um, Bob Merrill. They were collected in the 60s um, and they were collected across all of Minnesota. And they were this collection of frogs was really important in looking at basically the back, uh, comparing the rate of deformities that the MPCA and their team was finding to historical rates of deformities. Um, and so historically, um, by looking at this collection, the background rate of deformities is about 2%. Um, and they were finding basically around six to 8% of frog, uh, leopard frogs that were deformed. So this is a really important um, unintended use of the amphibian and reptile collection and establishing the fact that this was not essentially a historical phenomenon, that it was something um, that was really happening in the present. And so that, I think that's a kind of a really you know, interesting story. Uh, about the amphibian and reptile collection that I wanted to, to share with everyone tonight. Thank you. I it, That's a, such a wonderful story, just an example of unanticipated use of collections. I'm curious, was there, um, was this information, did any of this lead to like legislative change or um, an enact of like environmental protections? As far as I know, not. Um, it was kind of a really hot button issue for a while. Um, there, like, um, it was difficult to get funding um, for it after a while. Um, you know, uh, Judy and her team, I know, were kind of um, put, put in the hot seat a little bit by saying that they weren't academic scientists, and so they had trouble getting funding um, for some of the research. And I see someone here in the comments saying that, um, yeah, it's it actually, uh, it's Judy there right now. She said she, her, her study showed that many hotspots that had deformed frogs didn't have the parasite, um, which is true. And so there, there are different kinds of abnormalities that, that don't seem to be associated with, with parasites. And I don't know if maybe Judy wants to comment there um, in the comments a little bit about what those are, but I think it's a, um, it's a really cool story. And it was, re it was really great. I got to work with Judy uh, firsthand in the collection. So when I took over the collection, it didn't have a curator um, for about 10 years. Andrew worked as the interim curator um, and did an excellent job with it. But we have these specimens that needed to be accessioned. Um, and Judy came in with, with one of her colleagues and um, we spent um, probably about a week or so accessioning and getting all the data on these frog specimens um, to really you know, get them into the collection and to be accessible to the public. So I think there's, there's probably, like, for, in years to come, there's a really interesting story that's you have to come out of these frogs and you know, looking at the different kinds of developmental abnormalities and basically environments that they're associated with. That's wonderful. And I, what it's a great use of um, 
of if you're just thinking about like amphibian collections in general they're they, you know aquatic they <laughs> they're amphibious right they go from water to land and back so they're like great in um indicators for overall environmental health um and i think just it's you know one other anticip unanticipated use um, of that collection um, so thank you ken so much for that story we have one more um to you one more um scientists who are, we are going to be chatting with and i gotta sh shuffle the order of my windows here um but we are talking with um uh, brie yarde who is the curatorial assistant in the mammal collections and also a phd candidate in the department of ecology evolution and behavior and we're going to be talking with brie about the mammal collection brie are you here yeah hi emily hi, thanks brie. for the introduction uh, so the mammal collection here at the Bell um, has over 19,000 specimens, and most of these are from Minnesota, but we also have specimens that were collected around the world from uh, South America to the Philippines and even some from Antarctica. And um, the mammal collection specimens have been used for research from exploring species diversity in opossums and deer mice to tracking variation in coat coloration over time in snowshoe hares. And our collections are also important for teaching. So we have a dedicated set of mammal specimens that students in the mammalogy class here at the U can handle. Um, but they also get exposed to the full diversity um, of mammals that we have in our collections. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a study skin of a 13 line ground squirrel, which you might recognize as the inspiration of our beloved go Goldie Gopher. And traditionally, mammal specimens were prepared like this as a study skin, kind of like what Keith described for birds. So uh, we remove the animal skin from the skeleton and all the other innards and stuff it with cotton, sew it up. So great, now we have this tangible record that a 13 line ground squirrel was found in Scott County in 1997. But as we've talked about a lot tonight, um, people collecting specimens decades or centuries ago uh, didn't know how specimens could be used today. So, for example, um, if we look at the next slide, uh, in my PhD research, I'm using museum specimens to study this diverse group of uh, rodents from Madagascar, and I'm comparing them to their closest relatives on mainland Africa to see basically how the two groups have diversified since they split from each other. And in particular, one thing I'm looking at is their limb bones. So if we look at the next slide, um, I'm using CT scans of museum specimens like this. Uh, this is a deer mice, not one of the ones from Madagascar, but uh, I'm using scans like this to quantify the shapes of those limb bones. And it turns out that those uh, traditional skin preparations aren't really useful if you want to look at those full limb bones, because when, um, we make those skins uh, to keep the structure in the hands and the feet of the skin. We cut off their arms and leg bones, like right above the hands and feet. So what I learned recently was that um, when I was looking at specimens that I could borrow for CT scanning, even if the rest of a skinned individual's skeleton was preserved and I could theoretically scan it, those limb bones were broken. So I wouldn't be able to study the whole shape of those bones. So now when we collect mammal skeletons, uh, specimens, sorry, uh, the idea would be to preserve the whole animal in alcohol like this mouse was. So um, the whole skeleton is intact and even uh, the internal organs would be available for future study. Or if um, preserving them in alcohol isn't feasible, we would at least want to have different prep types for the same kind of animal. So uh, if we look at the next slide, that's something that, oh, there we go. So um, that's something that we showed uh, last summer with the Bell's Expeditions event, where we set up tents outside the Bell and prepared specimens in front of the public. And on the next slide, we can see that we had, oh, there we go. Uh, we had these great enthusiastic high school interns from underrepresented backgrounds working with us. And uh, we showed them, so they in turn were able to engage with the public alongside us about how we pre prepare specimens in different ways. So some as skins, some as full skeletons, 
and always taking samples from different tissues, the slivers of the lures uh, that can be used for genetic studies. And to sum it up, um, it's important that we keep what we can from the, when we prepare these specimens, because as has been emphasized this whole night, we don't know what kinds of questions these specimens will be able to answer 100 or even just 50 or 20 years from now. I love it. I also love that picture to end. It was just that squirrel was like, here we go. I'm about to be immortalized. Like it was just ready. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious, Brie, with your time doing public outreach um, with the tents, and I think what an amazing thing for the bell to do. You know, everyone was being resourceful and um, in early quarantine times. I'm curious, what were some of the most interesting questions that people had when you were out there? Uh, sometimes you get kids asking if they're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everything is dead. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that would not be. I had, um, actually, side note, um, a kid asked me one time, looking at different jars of fishes in a fish collection, asking at what time they would need to be moved to a bigger jar once they got too big. Oh, no. And you're like, oh, no. I'm sorry, this fish is getting no larger. <laughs> but um, but speaking of wonderful audience questions, here's a segue into the audience Q&A portion. Bree, thank you so much for sharing about the Mammal Collection. Um, this has been awesome. I want this event to go on forever, but unfortunately, I think we do have limits. So we're going to spend the next half hour or so going through some of your questions. Uh, feel free to drop them into the Q&A form. And I think, and so, you know, feel free to ask, we'll have the different scientists jump in um, as the question is relatable. Uh, but I think in general, just a little bit of context, um, Margo is curious to know who cares for the specimens in the collections. Um, Kylie wants to know, how do you care for the different types? Um, and I think that's just sort of a, a general throw out to everyone and see who picks it up. Maybe I should pick on somebody. I'll take, take that. <laughs> um, so we do. The short answer is we do. Um, and we do as in the curators do. Uh, but we also train students to learn how to take care of collections, learn how to build collections. So taking care of collections means, you know, preparing the specimens like uh, Brie was showing, um, taking care of the data that's associated with them, like Tim was showing. Um, archiving them, digitizing them, uh, maintaining them, making sure that like insects aren't coming into and eating them or making sure that the jars of ethanol are topped up. You know, there are all sorts of kind of daily mundane things, but then um, there are lots of exciting things too that we do with them. So we, um, we are ones taking care of them. And then we, uh, because we're in a university setting, we really enjoy also training the next generation of museum scientists. So we really value being able to do that and being able to show everyone all the cool things, but also what it takes to, to keep these, these invaluable specimens going on for more than 115 years. Did I forget anything? On the, I, I can just talk briefly about the botanical side. Um, and in the herbarium, we also have to be concerned about insects eating the specimens. Um, they can just re reduce the, the specimen to a pile of dust if, if we don't look out. And so all specimens that come into the herbarium, we, they get put through the freezer for, an, for at least a week before they actually get put into the collection. And that's one way we uh, try to control the pests, potential pests. And we also have to keep the humidity pretty low um, in order to stop mold forming on the specimens. And so assuming all those things are taken care of and the specimen is being properly dried and pressed when it was collected, some of the, these specimens, that, like, like we saw, can be 200 years old and look almost as good as the day that they were collected. And I, I would just wanted to quickly mention for genetic resources, um, some of these new ways we have of preserving things are pretty significant investments. So for um, genetic resources typically we're freezing tissues at below minus 80 Celsius and so we have freezers that are designed to do that 
but they have to be backed up um, with electricity. You know, we have to have generator backups. We have to have central monitoring. If they're use, if we're using liquid nitrogen, we have to have a lot of monitoring associated with that. So um, it's a pretty pretty big investment to to have those resources available to do things. You know, like sequencing genomes or surveying for you know viruses or diseases and things like that. I think this is a, a great lead into another question that people have had and that I'm personally curious about, which is that, you know, collections um, practices have changed. We've talked about how we might be using things like blood or boop, things that may not initially have been seen to be useful. Um, but so the practices have changed, but what about also the, the ethics, the concerns around collecting? The world looks very different today than it did 150 years ago. So how are new you know, considerations for ethics, for taking things internationally, for collecting endangered species? You know, how, how does that show up in, in work today? I might take that, Emily. I've just in my role as science director, I hear from the curators about the challenges that uh, they encounter working across borders, uh, working with the uh, internationally uh, recognized biodiversity protocols coming out of Nagoya, Japan a few years ago, uh, recognizing a lot of the issues that relate to sovereignty, uh, intellectual property. What happens if um, a major discovery that creates a, a very successful new technology comes from an organism that was collected somewhere by someone who, had, who didn't own that property, didn't own that organism. A great example is the, the enzyme that uh, we use so much in molecular genetics. It comes from a little bacterium for, that was first isolated in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so uh, we, we're, you know, we're dealing with those challenges uh, as a museum and recognizing that uh, uh, in some ways uh, collecting is more, has to be more thoughtful than it, uh, ever was, and and care has to be taken to um, uh, to consult with a lot of uh, potential stakeholders and be open to uh, new ways of collecting. Um, we, you know, it's controversial, but we're coming to rely a lot also on digital records. You know, um, leave only footprint. You know, leave no footprints. Take only photographs. Or it was the saying. You know, now we're doing with digital. You know, digital technology. We can capture so much video, sound, uh, imagery, and we have the capacity to process that. So I think it's a challenging but also exciting uh, time. You know, to be uh, thinking about the future of collecting in light of like ethical, legal, and other considerations. Yeah, and to that um, effect, we're talking about sharing, sharing of knowledge, sharing of um, this data. How does that work? You mentioned putting stuff online for public consumption, but you know, what if you have an ornithologist from Berlin that wants to borrow a bunch of specimens or wants to visit? How, do, how does this work fit into the greater scientific community as a whole? Maybe we'll throw that to, um, hey, Tim, you want to talk about that? You mentioned uh, first the- How about um, Andrew? I see Andrew is uh, oh, yeah. unmuted. Go for it. Well, I think, you know, interestingly, is museums have always been a worldwide interaction. So scientists have always shipped specimens back and forth. But uh, as technology has changed, we've become more and more of a global museum. And so you, you can think of a museum on a college campus as being a major piece of research infrastructure. And now it's being connected by digitized specimens, by uh, databases that can store all kinds of aspects about the specimen, the, the sequence, uh, images of the morphology, CT scans, and these can all be linked. And so you'll see with the Minnesota Biodiversity Atlas that you can actually access holdings from all kinds of other museums, not just ours. And you can, if you connect to other, other sites, and you can also see that we are pulling in data from all kinds of other uh, partners in the state. And so we really are moving into this, these uh, uh, museums are, are turning into this sort of global piece of research infrastructure for biodiversity studies. And it's fascinating to see it. 
Yeah, yeah that, I, that's I, so new and exciting uh, in the sense that, you know, museums, the only way to access these specimens historically was to go to the place and get beyond the gatekeepers uh, who are trying to balance preservation with access. And now we're in an area of open access. It's just opening up all kinds of possibility. But you can also get, phys researchers can also get physical access to those specimens still. I mean, I, I made the analogy to a library with books we, ha we, we are constantly sending specimens and receiving specimens in loans for people to do research. Um, and de depending on whether it's more efficient for a researcher to come to us and use the specimens in our collection or for us to just send some small, smaller groups of specimens to them, um, they, can, they can do science directly on those specimens if that's necessary, which in many cases it is. I didn't know if there was still anything you had to, to add to that, because I, if not, I have another question for you. Well, I would just say that um, I think uh, that digitizing specimens is a really fantastic way to make them much more accessible to a much wider audience. Um, and, and it's really amazing the opportunities there are uh, to get to, to use these specimens in digital form. But we also have to remember that um, you, cannot, uh, you cannot extract DNA from a, from a digital image or chemical composition from a digital image. So the specimens themselves are also vitally important. And, 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 and so I think it's really important to remember that. I'd agree with that. And your the images you showed of the herbarium sheets in particular, I think those, they just look fragile, right? You have dried plants that are pressed on sheets of paper. You know, I you think about, you know, God forbid, a fire or a flood event or something like that. Um, what are some of the big challenges to keeping this material intact? And we can start with Tim and then maybe want to um, hear from Ken or Bree and how that applies to um, alcohol collections and then maybe study skins as well. Well, for, for the herbarium collections, it's certainly, like I mentioned, important to make sure that we uh, exclude all uh, the insect pests and, and the humidity, uh, but handling them is, it's true, they are relatively delicate and fragile. The paper itself um, is often not of archival quality, not necessarily, and so the paper itself becomes very brittle, and in many cases we have to remount the specimen um, if it was mounted on a piece of non-archival acid-free paper. And so that's a big part of what we're doing is maintaining um, the integrity of the specimen. And one of the other ways we sort of uh, try to mitigate against damage is to, in many cases in the botanical world, is to collect duplicate specimens of a particular plant uh, species. So we might take several clippings from an individual tree and <laughs> keep one of those at the Bell Museum and then send other, the, the duplicates to other herbarium collections. So in the event that our specimen was damaged or destroyed, by some unforeseen circumstance, then there would be a copy of that specimen in another herbarium, in another institution. And so making those duplicate, duplicate specimens is a way we try to mitigate against the potential problem of damage or destruction. Um, so I guess I'll chime in for the, uh, the Avenal-based collection, the challenges. Um, so perhaps like the, like the largest one that we have is, um, you know, protecting them, obviously 70% ethanol, that's what they're stored in, it's incredibly flammable. So we need to take um, extra precautions, uh, you know, things like spark proof lighting, special, you know, kinds of ways to actually contain an explosion if like something were to happen. So there are blowout doors and things like that in there, um, should that ever happen. Um, another challenge is also, um, you know, ethanol evaporates, you know, it also evaporates and so, storing these specimens in um, jars that have lids with like proper seals. Um, and that's been a really large endeavor um, over the last probably decade and a half or so is taking these things, you know, out of jars that had, um, you know, some of the things that were, I know that were in the herb collection were basically like in peanut butter jars with like metal lids um, and putting them, you know, into, into jars that would prevent evaporation. Um, so the specimens don't dry out um, over time, you know, ethanol at this point is also incredibly expensive. I don't know what it's about, probably about $700 for a 55 gallon drum right now as well, too. So you don't want to 
um, be topping off specimens all the time. So it's kind of a, a really major expense and something evaporation is something you really want to mitigate. Bree, are there any um, special considerations for, you mentioned um, wanting to look at skeletal structure and keeping all that intact. Um, are there any other considerations for mammal collections? I'm thinking especially too about um, protections like for endangered species in your work. Do you ever deal with that? Um, doing research in Madagascar versus like doing research domestically in the US? So I've been uh, just using museum specimens. So I haven't actually done any work in Madagascar. I think maybe Sush could speak about that. Um, and the mammal collections, as well as the birds, we keep those in um, cabinets that are protected from moisture and insects. And we also try to stay on top of making sure that insects haven't gotten into the collections. I think it's interesting. We talk about historic collections and someone mentioned it in the Q&A was arsenic. Um, I think arsenic is uh, was historically uh, used as a pesticide, though now we know it is not. Um, it's great for preservation of the specimens, maybe not great for preservation for the researchers. Um, but, you know, that's one thing that I, I thankfully has changed over time. More collections management practices that are safer for people. I mean, the people are a, a part of this. Um, and so we have, you know, I, I want to leave a minute or two for everybody. I just think it'd be fun for um, us to go around and give you all a moment to just talk about why you wanted to become scientists. Like what inspired you to do what you're doing? And if you have a moment to just share with the folks at home, you know, just any, anything you want about how you are and what, how much you love the bell. Let's just start with Sushma. Um, thanks, Emily. So for me, it was exploration. You know, I was really excited about going to new places and exploring um, diversity of animals. I really liked animals. I really liked um, seeing new things and exciting things. And um, I will say, um, I've got to, being a scientist, I really get to explore all that. I get to go, go to cool places. I get to um, see exciting things. I get to come home and think about what I saw and compare it to other things and go into my collections and, and um, kind of really have time to reflect on it all. So I really like that. Keith, let's go to you. I got excited about the natural world growing up um, hunting and fishing and camping in Colorado. And so I really loved the outdoors and I got interested in birds. And uh, actually my middle school librarian's husband who was a professor at University of Denver gave me a copy of Ever Since Darwin, which is a collection of essays by Stephen Jay Gould. And I realized that people can study evolution. <laughs> and I had a really good uh, evolution class in biology um, undergrad, and that inspired me to, you know, move away from being a veterinarian um, to actually doing science. And and yeah, I read I read a paper by George Baraclaw, who ended up being my postdoc mentor, and that never looked back. Ken, um, what about you? Yeah, well, I'll just chime in. I mean, I grew up. I grew up in New Jersey, um, sort of a place where you say like, well, from what exit are you from? But I actually grew up in a, uh, a part of New Jersey that the Appalachian Trail ran really uh, close to like where I grew up. So I spent a lot of time outside growing up. So I had, you know, the natural world curiosity. And um, when I went off to college, I took an evolution class, which kind of inspired me. I thought that was really interesting. And I was actually really into mo uh, molecular biology and biochemistry. And when I found out that you could wed sort of the, the natural history with molecular biology in this field called molecular systematics, which I had never heard of before, um, I was kind of off and running. And it's kind of a, a really interesting antidote. Um, uh, I, was, I was going to be an ornithologist. I was going to be a systematic ornithologist. Uh, I was really interested in systematic ornithology, but um, be, ended up becoming a herpetologist. But the two first two scientific papers I ever read were um, I took at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab 
uh, was one by Bob Zink on uh, towies, speciation and towies, and a paper by uh, Scott Lanyon on the evolution of brood parasitism. And so that was, it was kind of really an interesting full circle when I ended up here interviewing uh, for a position at the Bell Museum with both of them. It was a really kind of serendipitous and kind of interesting kind of thing. So that's a really interesting personal story I wanted to share. Thank you, Ken. What about, let's go to Tim. Uh, I grew up in the UK and I was always interested in nature and hiking around the footpaths of, of the English countryside, but I had no idea that one could become a botanist and make a living out of it when I was growing up. And it wasn't until I came to the US and in fact, the, the, the place and time I can remember specifically when I realized I wanted to be a field botanist was in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in northern Minnesota in 1994, I think it was in June 94. And I was working for a uh, environmental education center leading uh, uh, teenagers into the boundary waters and we were doing natural history. And I was with several other people that really knew all the plants. And suddenly I realized that what I wanted to know was the names of all these plants that we were surrounded by. And so it was that, that experience in the boundary waters that got me interested in this idea of exploring and documenting and understanding the botanical diversity and it's what ended up bringing me here to the University of Minnesota where I studied with George, uh, tropical ecology, where we explore and document diversity in, in Papua New Guinea in quite a different environment. But the concept of exploration and discovery is the thing that really interests me um, in terms of uh, working for the museum. Andrew, do you wanna go? So those are all great stories and I'm sitting here in my office at home and so I grab this book, The World We Live In, which was given to me by my grandmother uh, for good work in grade two. And it has this, oh, I can't, it doesn't show, it's too bad. It has this crazy pictures of fish in the middle of it, these crazy deep sea fishes. And I see, every time I see that, it's like, how could a kid look at that and not wanna be an ichthyologist? So that's my story. And my grandmother regretted forever giving me the book because she wanted me to be an engineer. <laughs> he, he, as I give a bunch of natural history themed presents to my nieces and nephews. I am, um, yes, excited for their future. Um, Bree, last but not least, what's your, what's your story into science of natural history? And um, as you know, graduate student in this, what gives you the most um, excitement for your upcoming career and the work that you hope to be doing um, in museums? No pressure. <laughs> well, I I've always liked learning about animals, so I wanted to become a vet. And it was actually when I was an undergrad, I discovered the brain scoop and learned about museum collections. I did not know those were a thing, that there was so much behind the doors of museums and that um, people were keeping these collections showing like all the biodiversity that we can keep studying. And yeah, I just was really amazed by that idea of having collections of biodiversity and wanting to become part of that. And what am I most excited about? Just I guess generally contributing something to science and collections. I, I mean, you already have, right? I mean, this the work that you're doing now, it's part of the Bell Museum's research and part of the international work, part of the history of this University of Minnesota. It's all like the, we talk about the history of the Bell Museum in the future and the present is those things together. Um, and so last, um, thoughts, I want to go leave that question for George. Um, how did you get into science? What are you excited about? And then what is, what are you excited about for the future of the Bell? Well, these, uh, these stories that all have shared here tonight, I, I, I could riff on, you know, any one of them, but I think I'll, I'll trace it to, uh, you know, 
even before uh, any time in the classroom. And just the natural curiosity that I had as a child that I shared with my, my childhood friends. And especially when you're out of doors uh, and nature has uh, so much to teach us if we'll only just listen, you know, and look. Um, and so I think somehow throughout it, my education, uh, finding paths to just retain that curiosity about nature and when there's so much pressure uh, to um, perhaps uh, forget about that natural inclination that we have to just be fundamentally curious about everything and just all the amazing diversity of life. Um, so um, I think it's, you know, looking forward, I think this natural history is really poised um, to lead us into the future. Uh, you know, those of us in the natural sciences witnessed the growth of molecular biology and, and computational biology and so much technology kind of eclipse the classical study of things like anatomy and, uh, and taxonomy and, uh, you know, our collections are, are really grounded in all that. We're finding all these new uses for them. And we're increasingly learning that, you know, we've got to look at what nature has to offer us to find solutions to a lot of the challenges that we're facing uh, in this world today. Uh, and not just environmental challenges, all kinds of challenges. And I think we can learn a lot from life about that around us. So uh, just the enthusiasm that I see in our students in our uh, classes at the university today, in the, um, the kids who participate in Bell programs, the, you know, the families that bring them, I, I think we're, you know, we're on the cusp of a, re of a rebirth of natural history. And I just, you know, I can't wait to see, I wish I could be around uh, to see where it leads, but it's, you know, it's just great to be a part of. And um, I'm really grateful for all the work that uh, everybody is doing uh, at the museum uh, these days. That is well said. And I wanna thank everyone again for tuning in. This has been such an amazing program to be a part of. I am so excited and invigorated. Um, yeah, thanks for all the questions. And this has just been wonderful. Um, if you're just catching the tail end of this, that's okay. This recording will be available on Bell Museum's YouTube channel for rewatching later. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you can follow them on all their social accounts. And I'm gonna throw it back to George, I think, who's gonna be yeah. wrapping us up. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Emily. Uh, you've been a fantastic host. We're so delighted that you were able to join us. Thanks to the curators and staff who put this together tonight. Hope you can join us next time on Wednesday, April 20th at 7 p.m. for another virtual program. We're launching our new book, A Natural Curiosity, The Story of the Bell Museum. Uh, presentations by two of the book's authors, Barbara Coffin and Don Luce. The extraordinary 150-year journey we've been on and a focus on the leadership and innovation and public ed that has been a part of the Bell since it was the Bell. Uh, we're gonna hear from contributing authors as well. It's a free event. Register uh, to receive the Zoom link. And lastly, uh, thanks to the sponsors of the Bell's 150th anniversary, and especially tonight, General Mills for sponsoring this event and making it a great year for the museum. Take care, uh, be safe, and good night.